I want to talk to you about how to stimulate the planet. Planning for future climate change, forming climate solutions depends on understanding the future climate, and that depends on simulating the climate. So I'm here to report to you from the front lines of climate simulation technology. So this is an audacious task. I mean, the physics span 10 orders of magnitude in space and time. I think about clouds, the details of the chemistry of a nucleating cloud particle matter, whether to whether water vapor wants to congregate around it and how that heats the atmosphere through condensational heating and interacts with microscale turbulence, and then turbulence on scales of kilometers and cities and turbulence on scales of, of countries and, and synoptic phenomena. And all of those scales matter. And uh, if you want to simulate the planet hundreds of times to sample many what-if scenarios of the future, you unfortunately, even with the most powerful supercomputers, can't do justice to all of that complexity. And meanwhile, humanity's questions about the future climate are too broad for future simulation technology. Uh, normally, climate simulation works like this. A bunch of very talented computational scientists and Earth system scientists uh, task supercomputers to solve thousands of equations. And, um, and because we can't admit all that complexity in the physics, we can't write down all the things we wish we could solve, uh, the computers aren't powerful enough, that leads to problems. And some of the problems are that Climate predictions are too coarse resolution. You get information on the scale of counties, we need information on the scale of infrastructure. And there are missing processes in today's climate simulations. Don't get me wrong, the supercomputers are amazing. This is one of the great new ones being installed at the Swiss Supercomputing Center where uh, European climate scientists are exploring the potential of next generation kilometer scale global simulation technology. But they're not big enough for what I obsess over, which are these clouds which I live next to. I drive from San Diego to Irvine. I see these out the window. It looks like a, a gray band on the horizon. We call it the marine layer. If it wafts in on a beach day, you're bummed out because it makes you cold. But what matters is that it's the edge of a massive sheet of low clouds that you'll see out your window from the airplane half the way on the flight from San Diego to Hawaii. And that cloud reflects a lot of energy from the planet, keeping it cooler than it would be otherwise. So if it dissipates, like ice sheets surely will, that will amplify global warming. And, my kids' hazards and my hazards. Um, but if it thickens up, which it could, that will damp it, and that's a multi-trillion dollar uncertainty. And it's a simulation problem. We know these clouds take very high resolution to simulate that we can't afford to deploy in climate simulation yet. Um, so that's resolution. The other thing is ensemble size. Ensemble means multiple realizations of the future because this is a chaotic system. You have to, in weather prediction, you don't just predict one hurricane, you predict hundreds of hurricanes. You hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And we don't know enough about low likelihood, high impact, rare events because they're so limited in the observational record. Um, and climate risk modelers, for, because of the same computational constraints, cannot sample such events satisfyingly today. So these are fundamental problems just with the computational challenge of climate simulation. And I want to tell you about a really exciting solution that no one would have predicted 10 years ago, which is that AI learning from data at scale can do remarkable things. This is a texted video uh, uh, AI generator. And just look at that fluid dynamics and tell me that some physics hasn't been learned without equations just from learning from the internet scale of videos. Now, you know, that's not just pretty animations, but you can put hard numbers on this when it comes to weather prediction. Um, the business of weather prediction has totally changed in the last three years. Everywhere there's a blue square here. Someone's fully AI version of weather prediction at some tech company or university lab is beating the world's gold standard physics-based weather predictions for some variable at some lead time. And uh, it's remarkable. This took the cover of science last year at the AI revolution in weather forecasting. Our best, the world's best weather predictions now come from models that we don't understand that don't have physics equations in them. And, and they're not just memorizing patterns. I think they've learned physics. I didn't think so two years ago, but like card-carrying atmospheric scientists at the University of Washington are taking these AI weather models, which were trained on the mess of the real atmosphere, which is very noisy and messy, and then after the fact, probing them and asking if they've learned physics by doing things like this. This is like you're putting a bullseye in the blue circles there of low pressure on an otherwise smooth background state in the West Pacific and watching what happens. And this is what happens. This is called baroclinic instability. It's a phenomenon we learn about in graduate school in atmospheric science. We learn about it by writing with pencils and papers and doing math. Um, no version of it this clean was ever in the training data. And there was no constraint in the AI model that physically a local perturbation deserves a local response. And yet, um, once trained, we're, we're learning that they have these properties. And this is one piece of a growing canon of evidence that is making a strong case that these AI models 
are learning real physics in the apparent act of video generation. And so that has deep implications because physics-based models are brittle. They have limitations. You know, I mentioned, for instance, you have to make approximations about processes like unresolved clouds that are subgrid. And those approximations are imperfect, and they create a barrier to using data. So it's hard to assimilate direct observations of clouds from space into numerical models because of these assumptions. And when you remove the physical assumptions, things become much more flexible. The ability to use many more data streams increases. And uh, um, that, that's game changing. What's really game changing is short circuiting Moore's law. This chart kind of shows you on a log scale on the y axis how the resolution of climate models has increased over the past decades of supercomputers have allowed it um, from the scale of hundreds of kilometers in the early 2000s to today about 25 kilometer resolution. But how much more we have to go? Tens of thousands of times more compute to get to the kilometer scale, hundreds of millions of times to get to the scale I would like to do justice to those low clouds I live next to. Um, you can't wait for Moore's Law. If we did that, climate change would have already happened. Um, AI, once trained, these AI weather models are thousands of times faster than their physical counterpart. Throughout the history of weather prediction, there's been a tension between resolution, you'd like more, hurricanes are more realistic and high resolution, and ensemble size, you'd like to have many more realizations of a hurricane to plan for the worst. The tension is gone. Once trained, the AI model has its resolution and it's trivial to inference. And that's opening up a new technology of huge ensemble weather forecasting that I think has implications for climate risk modeling. I'll tell you a little story here. Some UC Berkeley climate extremes experts took NVIDIA's AI forecast model, which you're looking at here, just autoregressively rolling out what it's learned from feeding off of tens of thousands of days of satellite observations. Um, and they, they figured out how to make that fit for purpose for studying very rare heat extremes, like this event in 2021 that caused a city in Canada to ignite uh, uh, like four or five sigma uh, heat extreme. And there's some technical details here that interest me. It turns out you have to train a few dozen versions of the AI model to sample structural uncertainty in the learning. And then you have to borrow some tricks from the 1980s to promote optimal dispersion and get a well-calibrated probabilistic prediction that is fit for purpose for looking at tail events. But these challenges have been solved this year. There's a couple of great papers under review right now. And the team's gone ahead and made a whole new data set that has 7,000 counterfactual versions of each of 2023 summer summer days. Um, and, and so that's a, a revolutionary data set that's unlocked by the speed of AI weather prediction. And I believe that gives climate risk modelers a new tool to calibrate our exposure to present climate extreme events in order to, um, to, to most appropriately measure our risk to future changes in those extremes. And it's just it's one piece of how AI is disrupting the whole Earth system modeling stack, which I can't get into. But I want to lean into one aspect of AI that I think is going to have a lot of implications in the future, which is interactivity. It's unsatisfyingly right now that getting climate predictions is like going to the Oracle. You know, they're made by groups of scientists that, you know, they produce large data sets and explore many what-if scenarios, and you have to go to those data. And users cannot participate in the simulation process, ask their own what if questions about future climate easily. But AI predictions, because of how they're developed, going forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards during optimization, they easily run in reverse, which allows you to go after the fact and ask not only what was the weather, but what would have changed if the initial conditions had been slightly different. And that's deeply important, because that means that um, we might be entering a future where we can query the weather. We can understand our influence on it quite easily without having to experience all the bottlenecks of conventional simulation. Um, you know, I fully expect, and my atmospheric science colleagues expect, that we don't know the limits of the Earth system's predictability. There are some things that are very hard to write equations for, like ecosystems, but which exert memory in the system through soil moisture. Um, and we expect there to be gains in our, in our knowledge of how much predictability there is. And being able to go backwards may help us understand scientifically what, what those gains are and why they exist in hindsight. But if you imagine the future in five years, um, I think the, the really important paradigm of interactivity are chains and cascades of AI digital twins. On the one hand, of physical infrastructure, so many companies now build digital twins of a factory before breaking ground and optimize and differentiate through it. So you can imagine a future that's evolving towards AI digital twins of the climate, coupled to AI digital twins of extreme weather, coupled to digital AI digital models of power plants and the electric grid and to understand how changes in climate extreme statistics 
will cause issues or study and optimize against um, issues that might affect resiliency of that grid. So I think this interactivity really matters. It allows a new path for us to more naturally explore consequences of our action. And maybe, maybe one day these chains of digital twins will be wrapped in the machinery of reinforcement learning to optimize for societal outcomes in new ways that we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. And so, yes, Earth's physics are vast. They span too many orders of magnitude in space and time. And, and humanity's questions are too broad for normal simulation technology. And in that context, um, it's a, a privilege to work in a community in academia and industry where machine learners and climate domain scientists are having very important conversations about next generation climate simulation that will use scientific AI. So thank you for your time.